I just want to add a footnote before I start my message to Brother Charlie's message this morning. I thought that was a great message, lifted up the Word of God. In James chapter number 1 and verse 22, the Bible says, But be ye doers of the Word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Brother Charlie preached this morning about going on to perfection and growing in grace and getting in the Word of God. Let me just say this. It's important that we get into the Word of God and the Word of God gets into us and that we study the Scriptures and we meditate on the Scriptures, we memorize the Scriptures. But it's not just how much Scripture you know, it's how much Scripture you put into practice. It's how much you do. The knowing is fine, but a lot of people know what they're supposed to do and they just don't do it. So to grow, we have to know the Word of God, hear the Word of God, receive the Word of God, but we also have to put it into practice. And then he talked about strong meat and uh, wanted to hopefully give a little strong meat up here tonight. Second Peter, chapter number two. I'm preaching, uh, maybe for some people, a hard message but I want to do it with a good spirit and a right spirit. In 2 Peter chapter number 2, if you'll turn with me uh, in the scriptures tonight, I think it'll really help you. 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 1, there were false prophets also among the people. A false prophet was somebody that did not speak the truth. They spoke errors. There were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. So Peter here is telling us there's, there were false prophets before, there's going to be false prophets until the Lord comes, who, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. A heresy is a false teaching. And there's a lot of false teaching going on in the world today. There's a lot of false teaching on the internet. There's a lot of false teaching on TV and on radio and in churches. And the Bible talks here about false teachers and it talks about damnable heresies. Damnable heresies, that's a strong word. But I want to preach tonight on one damnable heresy, the damnable heresy of limited atonement. Limited atonement. And uh, turn, turn, <coughs> didn't come out right. Titus chapter number three. Turn over there with me if you would. In Titus chapter three, and I give you a minute to get there. Verse number 10. The Bible says, a man that is a heretic, a false teacher, after the first and second admonition, reject. In other words, if somebody's teaching something that isn't true, and you talk to them about it, and they don't change, then the Bible says, reject. Knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. Now, hyper-Calvinism is, uh, I use also the word reformed theology, is very prevalent today. And I don't believe any of it. I believe it's false teaching. I believe it's heresy. Now, here's the thing. If they're right, I'm wrong. If I'm right, they're wrong but we can't both be right. Things that are different are not the same. Let me say that again. Things that are different are not the same. You can't have one person teach one thing, somebody else teach something else, and both be right. Because they're opposites, all right? Now, let me say this. When we talk about Reformed theology, and there's a lot of different people on the radio. I'll mention R.C. Sproul tonight. And some of these people have great gifts of teaching and all. 
But there's a difference between studying theology and studying the Bible. Theology is an intellectual exercise. And when you study theology, you're studying what somebody else says the Bible says. The Reformed theologians go back to John Calvin, who was one of the Reformers. And we'll talk about him in just a minute. John Calvin wrote Calvin's Institutes, and it's a system of theology. And a lot of people study his Institutes, and they believe this Reformed doctrine that teaches a limited atonement. I'm not a theologian. I'm a Bible student. I understand a lot of theology. I like what Billy Sunday says. I've quoted him a hundred times from his pulpit. He said, I don't know much theology, but I know the theos. There's a lot of theologians that don't believe the Bible. And people study them, and they get all messed up. They get all mixed up. In 2 Timothy 4, Paul said this. He said, preach the word. He said, the time will come when they'll not endure sound doctrine. But they'll heap to themselves teachers having itch and ears. And they'll turn away their ears from the truth and should be turned unto fables. I think the whole Calvinistic system is one big fairy tale. But it's also a serious thing. It's a heresy. It kills churches and it kills evangelism. You say, why is the Northeast so, so unevangelized? One reason is because it was the stronghold of, of Calvinism. All right? So in Jude, it talks about earnestly contending for the faith once delivered to the saints. We need to know what the Bible teaches. We need to know what sound doctrine is. And we need to believe the Word of God. Let me pray. Lord, I please bless this message. Lord, I pray, God, that we would be open to the truth and we would let the Scripture speak for us. Pray we wouldn't have a closed mind. And I ask you this in Jesus' name, amen. Now, you know, it's hard to talk to a Jehovah Witness about the Bible because they've already got their mind made up before you even talk to them. And a lot of times people in religion, they already know what their religion teaches and they have a closed mind. So we need to be open to the scriptures. Everything I give you tonight will be from the scriptures, okay? Now, let me give you a couple things about Calvin's background. Calvin came out in the Reformation, came out of the Dark Ages, and just like Luther, they had some good things, but they also had a lot of faults, and they had a lot of false doctrine. Number one, Calvin was a baby sprinkler, and the Bible doesn't teach that baptism is sprinkling, and the Bible doesn't teach you baptize babies, all right? That's something that they brought out of the Catholic Church with them. Catholic Church teaches that a baby is born again when they're baptized. And the Catholic form of baptism is just sprinkling. All that's wrong. So I'm not gonna put a lot of faith in somebody that doesn't even have enough sense to know that you don't baptize babies. Somebody say amen. amen. Yeah, all right? Calvin and the Reformed theologians have a false plan of salvation. That's really serious, folks. It doesn't get more serious than that. How many people have ever heard R.C. Sproul on the radio? Good, good teacher as far as a gift of teaching. But what he teaches is Reformed theology. It's a, it's a hyper-Calvinism, and it's false doctrine. Let me quote R.C. Sproul. Here's what he said. Before a person can choose Christ, he must be born again. One does not first believe and then become reborn. Let me say that again. Before a person can choose Christ, he must be born again. One does not first believe and then become reborn. Can I tell you what? The Bible says that you believe and then you get saved. The jailer didn't say, what must, what must I do to believe? 
You see, the hyper-Calvinists believe in total depravity, and they don't believe that anybody can get saved. They don't, that's a, they, they believe that's some kind of a work and somebody's spiritually dead, they can't trust Christ. So what they believe is that somebody is elected before the foundation of the world and they're already saved. It's like being born saved. How many of you remember Harold Camping, his biggest heretic on the radio? He could not give you a salvation experience because he believed he was born saved. So the Calvinists believing you're elect, you're already born saved. The funny thing is none of them can prove that they're one of the elect because there's nothing in the Bible that to shows you how to prove you're one of the elect. Let me just say this. I said this in Sunday school today. Nobody was born on the ark. Noah, Mrs. Noah, Ham, Shem, Japheth, and their wives all went in that ark. The ark's a picture of salvation, and they all went through the door to get onto the ark. The door is a picture of Christ. So what I'm saying is this. Nobody's born saved. All right, you weren't born saved. You were born a sinner. David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. You with me? So we're born with that fallen nature. We're bearing the image of Adam right now. We will bear the image of Christ one day. Some of you want some strong meat. So they have a false plan of salvation. They do not believe in the millennial reign of Christ. They spiritualize it. They don't believe that the Lord is going to come back and rule and reign on this earth for a thousand years. They equate Israel with the church and the church with Israel. They believe in a replacement theology that the church has taken the place of Israel and God is finished with Israel. Don't tell Donald Trump that. (laughs) Don't tell Benjamin Netanyahu that because they don't believe it. But this is what Reformed theology teaches. Calvin was a disciple of Augustine, who was a Catholic saint. He was a reader, a studier. He got his theology from Augustine. Calvin had somebody burned at the stake. His name was Michael Servetus. And Michael Servetus disagreed with Calvin on infant baptism, and he was put to death. Now, Calvin wanted him to have a more merciful form of execution than being burned at the stake. But he still went along with the idea of this man being put to death because he didn't agree with Calvin on infant baptism. Here's one. Calvin taught that church membership was necessary for salvation. Where do you think he got that from? How about about the Catholic Church that basically ruled the world for hundreds of years because the kings were afraid of getting excommunicated because if you got excommunicated, you're out of the church, you couldn't be saved. Here's what Calvin, I'm quoting Calvin's institute. He says, to stand outside of the church is to cut oneself off from God's storehouse of the bread of life. For the church is the sphere, the sphere within which the grace of God exclusively operates. Let me read that again. To stand outside of the church is to cut oneself off from God's storehouse of the bread of life. For the church is the sphere within which the uh, grace of God exclusively operates. I don't believe Calvin is a credible source of authority. I think he just, just what I've read here would just disqualify him and he can write all the institutes he wants. I'm not going to waste my time reading them. They maybe make some good fire starters. Um, I'm going to preach just a little bit here on limited atonement and limitless atonement. I believe in limitless atonement. Now listen, God, God does two great works in this world. He does the work of creation. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And he does the work of redemption. The work of redemption, God's great work. Now listen, limited atonement takes away from the greatness of redemption. It subtracts from it, it limits it, it shrinks it down 
to a small group. Limited atonement subtracts from the greatness of redemption, takes away from God's grace and God's mercy, all right? I don't believe in limit, limited atonement. I believe in a limitless atonement. The hyper-Calvinist Reformed theologians believe Christ died just for the elect. I believe Christ died for every person that ever lived. He died for everybody. That doesn't mean everybody is saved. I don't believe in universal salvation, meaning Christ died for everybody, so everybody's saved. I believe everybody is savable. I believe he can save anybody. Look with me over in Matthew chapter 19. Now, I didn't give much scripture yet, but I'm going to give scripture. In Matthew 19, the rich young ruler has just come to Jesus and gone away sorrowful. Because Jesus told him, take everything you have and give it to the poor and come and follow me. Because Jesus knew what his problem was. He was a money lover. All right? So here's what he says to his disciples. Matthew 19, 23. Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of God. It's hard for a rich man to get saved. Again I say unto you, it's easy for a camel, easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were seemingly amazed. And they said, who then can be saved? Who then can be saved? I'm going to preach another message soon on who can be saved. And I don't believe what the hypercalmists believe about who can be saved. So they asked this question, who can be saved? Jesus beheld them and he said unto them, with men this is impossible. But notice what he says. But with God, all things are possible. Now, in the context, he's talking about people getting saved. And what he's saying is, anybody can get saved. Anybody can get saved. Do you believe that? That isn't what hyper-Calvinists believe. They believe that there are certain people that are predestined before the foundation of the world. They're the only ones that can get saved. Let me read you something. I got this in the mail yesterday. Dear Pastor Clark, I'm writing after reading a track entitled, Which Way Should I Go?, which had your address on it. I'm looking to fellowship and learn more about your church and offer the following brief background on myself. I've been in prison since 1994. I'll be released in 2024. My crime is murder. I killed my girlfriend in a drunken rage. I gave my life to Christ on October 20th, 2002. Amen. I'm 52 years old, divorced twice, have two grown children, and my sixth grandchild was born last month. I hope to hear from you at your convenience. Take care and God bless. This man's in Southwoods Prison. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you believe he could get saved? Amen. You know, murder, I mean, that's a shocking thing. I, I, most of us, I hope we haven't murdered anybody. But let me just say something. If that man couldn't get saved, David couldn't get saved. And Moses couldn't get saved. And Paul couldn't get saved. Now what I'm saying is this. God can save anybody. Don't limit God. Don't limit salvation. So I want to look at some verses. 2 Peter chapter 2. We already looked at it once. We'll look at it again. 2 Peter, and if you just look at these, I have about 10 verses. I'm just going to read them and then I'll be done. 2 Peter chapter number 2. There were false prophets among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately should bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Notice the phrase there even denying the Lord that bought them. There's going to be false prophets and false teachers that deny the Lord. But notice, the Lord that bought them. Even though they're not saved, Christ died for them. 
You say, well, how can that be? Again, listen to me. When Christ dies on the cross, he doesn't save anybody. Christ dying on the cross didn't save you. That sounds like heresy, doesn't it? Christ dying on the cross made it possible for you to be saved. But there had to be a time and a place when you trusted him. You with me? Even though these people never trust him, even though they're damned, it doesn't mean that the blood wasn't sufficient for them to be saved if they would have chosen him. Now again, hyper-Calvinists don't believe in free will. They don't believe you have the ability to choose even though the Bible teaches the opposite. So look with me over in John 3. I think most of you know John 3.16. I'm going to read it to you the way the hyper-Calvinists read it. For God so loved the elect that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the elect, but the elect through him might be saved. Now listen, I know I'm one of the elect because I've been saved. And I'm not mocking the idea of the elect, but I'm saying it's not the way they say it. The Bible says here, God so loved the world. Now here's what I believe this means. It means every man, every woman, every person without exception. Let me say that. You look at that and see if that doesn't fit. What is God talking about when he said he loves the world? And then he turns around and says, love not the world. Because when he says, love not the world, he says, all in the world, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. He's talking about the sinful part. When he says, God so loved the world, he's talking about people. All right? So, listen, if I believe that Christ died for the elect, but he didn't die for everybody, I cannot get up in church and say, God loves you. Because I don't know who the elect are. And the way hyper-Calvinists see it is God only loves the elect. He doesn't love the lost. I can't get up and say, Christ died for you. I can't say, if you call upon the name of the Lord, he'll save you because you may not be one of the elect. Do you understand where I'm coming from? Do you understand? Listen, let me make this statement. Do you understand how evil that doctrine is? Look in John chapter 1. And verse 29. The next day, John seeth Jesus, Jesus coming unto him. And he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the elect. It doesn't say that. But people read into it. Just like Jehovah Witnesses read into the scriptures and take away from the scriptures. They corrupt. Paul talked about people that corrupt the word of God. They change the words. They change the meaning Of the words. He said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. When he said he takes away the sin of the world, he meant it. He meant it. Look in Isaiah, and I'll be done in just a few minutes. Please turn with me, though. Isaiah 53. You should be familiar with Isaiah 53. Turn over there with me. Isaiah 53. Look at one verse, verse number six. All we, all means all, and that's all all means. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. Now, what does that mean? That means everybody has sinned. Romans 3.23 says this, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Is there anybody in here tonight and I've had people do this. Is there anybody in here tonight that's sinless and you never sin? I've had people tell me that. I don't sin. I'm not a sinner. It's like, man, you're out of your mind. But I've had people just dead serious. No, I don't sin. What is the all here? It's all. It's everybody. Every person in this room has sinned. All right? Here it is. Real. I'm not, I'm not changing the scripture. I'm not, you know, using the word of God deceitfully. 
All, have, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Can I say to you, the last all is the same as the first all. I mean, just look at it. Don't take my word for it. All have sinned is every person without exception. And when it talks about the Lord laying on him, the iniquity of us all, it's every person without exception. This whole idea of limited atonement is from hell. You say, that's awful strong. I mean every word I'm saying tonight. Look in Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter number 2. I'm in Timothy. Hebrews chapter number 2. Look at one verse with me. I'll read it. Verse number 9. I'm in 2 Timothy. Give me a minute. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death, notice, for every man. Let me ask you a question. How could an honest person read this verse and believe that Jesus only died for some. Let me say it again. How could an honest person believe that Jesus only died for a certain group? I was out in Illinois, and I was out there bow hunting in Illinois, and I, mean, I was out in the middle of nowhere, and there was a bunch of cornfields, miles of cornfields, and out in the middle of one of these cornfields was a little church. It was called Five Point Church talking about the five points of Calvinism. I guarantee it was one of the deadest churches in the world. It had to be. So Jesus tasted death for every man. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Look in 2 Peter. And what happens is people that don't want to believe the truth, everywhere they read these verses, they replace world or men or whatever with the word of elect. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 9, a lot of you have memorized this verse. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. Talk about the promise of his coming. Jesus is coming again, amen. As some men count slackness, but he's long-suffering to usward. Notice, not willing that any should perish. You can add the word elect there if you want to. But you're doing just exactly what the Bible says not to do. You don't add to the word of God. You don't take away from it. And you're on slippery slopes when you add to the word of God. He's not willing that any should perish. But that all Every person, without exception, should come to repentance. That's what the Bible teaches. It teaches Jesus loves the world, God loves the world, Christ tasted death for every man, and there's no such thing as a limited atonement. Look in 1 Timothy 2. We're almost done. 1 Timothy chapter 2. We're teaching the book of Timothy in adult Sunday school class. If you're not in a Sunday school class, you ought to come. You want to go on to perfection. You want to be mature. You want to be able to handle strong meat, rightly divide the word of God. Don't lay home in bed on Sunday morning. Or don't stand out and hang outside there in the lobby and drink coffee. Amen. Some of you, I don't know why you come to church if you just hang out in the lobby all the time. 
I didn't come to hang out in the lobby. I go to Starbucks, I want to drink coffee. <laughs> Coffee's supposed to be before Sunday school, not during. That was just an extra we threw in. <laughs> you know, they say when you throw a stone, the only dog that hollers is the one that gets hit. I exhort, therefore, 1 Timothy 2, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have, notice, all men, not all elect, all men, everyone without exception, who will have all men to be saved. And it's not his will that any should perish. And come unto the knowledge of the truth. Everybody, listen, everybody's not going to get saved. We know that. But everybody could be saved. God never predestined anybody to hell. Who will have all men to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. For there's one God and one mediator between God and men, not the woman Mary, but the man, Christ Jesus. Look at that verse. That's a great verse. There's one God, one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. You know there's a man in heaven? And his name is Jesus. He's man and he's God. When he became man, he didn't stop being God. And when he went back to heaven, he didn't stop being man. Who gave himself, notice, a ransom. That's our redemption. That's the blood. A ransom for all. For all to be testified in due time. Don't take away the power of the blood. The power of the blood is powerful enough to save everybody. Not just a few people. There's no limit on the precious blood of Christ. But if you believe hyper-Calvinism, there is. Look at one more verse. 1 Timothy 4. Therefore, we both labor, verse 10, and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. Now, we have two things here. We have the provision and we have the application the provision is he's the savior of all men meaning it's possible for all men to be saved all men are savable nobody is too bad to be saved so he's the savior of all men in the sense that he tasted death for every man he shed his blood for every man he gave his life for every man but the only ones are going to be saved, especially those that believe. They're the ones that actually get saved. I've used this illustration probably a hundred times. If I go preach in some church somewhere where they don't know me, I have all these great illustrations. Around here, everybody says, oh, I heard that one before. <laughs> My daughter was graduating from college. Mrs. Clark and I went out to the graduation they had a picnic the day before graduation. My daughter bought us tickets to the picnic. It was a chicken dinner. We borrowed Mr. Neese's van because we didn't have a good car. His van broke down. We missed dinner. Now listen, the chicken was already paid for. It was all paid for. It was all bought. 
We just never ate it. There's a lot of people and their salvation has already been paid for, but they didn't ever enjoy it. They didn't ever partake of it because they didn't get saved. That doesn't mean they couldn't have been saved. Man has free will, which is another message I don't have time for. Man has free will. You have free will. You can choose to receive Christ or you can choose to reject Christ. But if the hyper-Calvinists are right, which means the Bible has to be wrong, they would say this, only the elect are the ones that Christ died for. And the people that weren't elected before they were ever born have no chance of all being saved, so they must just be predestined for hell. Couldn't get saved if they wanted to. Can I say this? There's not going to be one person in hell that can say, I couldn't get saved. It's going to be, I wouldn't get saved. 